Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Welcome to my first artist profiles with myself, Mr. Mike von Beeringham, and the rather marvellous Mr. Ed Osborne. Hello. Hello, Ed. And for once, it's really nice that I can actually hear someone who's talking into the microphone. <laughs> good work, sir. Well done. How yes. are you, dear boy? I'm good, thank you, mate. It's uh, yeah, Thank you for having me here. No, Very pleasure, good. as always. How long have I known you? It's getting to that point where you get to Ooh. an age where you've known people so long you can't remember Ooh. how you met, where you met. Now, there's a question. Mm. Um, I think it's got to be at least 12 years, I think. Yeah? Was it? Yeah, I reckon. Was it band mm. stuff? I think it was band stuff. I think it was actually uh, when Annika had a birthday party. I think Aaron got a band together, and I think we possibly met through that. Although paths would have crossed before then, I think, through various Very heavy metal true. bands. And Indeed. <laughs> For those of you who remember, Aaron is the big, tall, kind of Thor-looking type chap we had on the stream uh, quite a while ago. We did an interview with Aaron. Um, yeah, so... The whole reason for doing these artist profiles is I've done interviews with musicians before and everything, but it's always been a bit kind of... It was during the middle... Well, during the middle of COVID. It mm. still is the middle of COVID. Uh, hello, Atta, by the way. How are you doing, dear boy? Lovely to see you. Sorry we've been away for a while. Um, yeah, so it was very kind of one person at one end of a Skype line and trying to kind of play a little bit of what they like. So the whole point of doing the artist profiles is to get musicians I know in here playing songs that they like and enjoy, so you actually get to see what they can do and just have a general chat about music with them in general. So what should we do? Should we, should we do a nice easy one to warm up? I think we should, yeah. Before you <laughs> blow my guts out <laughs> vocally. <laughs> so, um, well, actually, we can start with uh, where it all began for you. So what got you into guitar? Um... I think I was about 12 years old when I started and uh, a few of my friends in school were starting to learn and at the time I was into you know various hobbies as kids are. Um, I tried various sports and I was useless at all of them Same. and it's just something appealed to me about the guitar. I think the idea of being able to study something myself um, with no pressure and be able to create something myself mm. um, and I think from there I kind of was keen on it and then there was a documentary on BBC Two, I think, about the history of Fender guitars, and Jimi Hendrix appeared on there, and it was at Woodstock, and he was just shredding, you know, and it was just all the standard pentatonic stuff he does, but at the time, I was like, wow, mm. what's that? Yeah. That's amazing. I want to do that. And I still can't, but <laughs> it inspired me to... <laughs> to uh to continue with it and yeah from there my parents sort of realized i was quite keen on it and obviously was going to stick at it so they got me lessons with a very good guitar teacher a guy named kevin butcher who i think is still sort of active in the Ipswich music scene somewhere cool um and yeah he came from a band called blade chain who were kind of at the tail end of the melodic sort of 80s rock thing mm. a very good band worth looking up um and he got me from there into, you know, all sorts of, like, Van Halen and stuff like that. And from then on, it was just, you know, down the rabbit hole. Um, and, yeah, I think the grunge thing was big as well when I was starting out. Yeah. Um, which was, was cool as well um, because, you know, a lot of those bands weren't necessarily the greatest musicians, but the songwriting was amazing. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it was all good stuff to, to learn on, really. So our first track is going to be a Jimi Hendrix number. Ah. And I've just realised I need the words for this. Let me see if I actually have them. I'm as well prepared as always, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> it, it's been a manic week. <laughs> trying to squeeze... Yeah, you're air. a busy man. Oh, I've got a couple of Dep gigs and things at the weekend, so I've been trying to s squeeze learn everything in for those. Yes, yes. Um, you know what it's like. Yes. Right, so we want... Okay, big library... If not, I can make the words up. I've got my phone there. I can always grab those. Uh, L, I believe it begins with. Little Wing. There we go. <laughs> There's only like two verses, stroke choruses yeah. or whatever, <laughs> isn't there? Something about zebras. And <laughs> <laughs> Some other drug fuel <laughs> ridiculousness. Okay. So we are going to do Jimi Hendrix, Little Wing. So why did you choose this particular song? Because um, I think for me this song kind of 
embodies what I think Hendrix is about. Because um, a lot of people I find, especially the kind of, when I was growing up anyway, the more kind of shreddy metal guitarists were like, well, what does Hendrix do other than, you know, burn guitars and that? And for me, it was never really about the lead playing. It was more about the kind of chord soloing and what he did with his rhythm playing because um, he was a session player before he went on to do his solo yeah, stuff. Yeah, he played with um, Little Richard, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. He was his backing band. And played in a lot of the soul scenes, so he kind of, you know, he had to kind of fill out the sound a bit, so he did a lot of these nice little... <laughs> those kind of, like, inversions. Can yeah. I just point out, by the way, this is the first time we've actually had a live amp <laughs> it's I been apologise, I'm old school. <laughs> no, it, no, it sounds very nice. It's it's been DI all the way ever since we've done these streams. So, uh, hello at the back, you. <laughs> Hopefully, it doesn't blow a valve halfway through. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's do it. Little Ving. Let's uh, actually get the track in the right place this time. Rob, here we go. <laughs> track for that yesterday. Ed hasn't heard it. That's all good. That's all right. I think that was that was enough soloing anyway. Shall we um, customary um, Suffolk greeting for Brad? One, two, three. Roy ba. ba. <laughs> How's it going, Ba? You right? How you doing, darling? How's your hair? I uh, love Brad. He's a good lad. He is. I'd love to get him in here one day. I have to play a gig with him one day. That'd be nice. Yeah. It's been a while. Yes. Right, shall we uh, up the ante a little bit? So, after the Hendrix, where did we venture from there? Where did you go, oh Ed? Well, I think, as I said, I had a guitar teacher who was very much into the 80s rock scene. And one day he played me this riff. And I was like, what was that? And it was Running With The Devil by Van Halen. Ah. And after that, I had to learn or had to, you know, try and learn some Van Halen stuff. So he did me a copy of um, the first Van Halen album. And yeah, to this day, if I want to put like, a guitar album on, that's probably the one I go for mm. for the most part. 
Um, again, like amazing lead player, but it was for me it was all about his rhythm playing and the little inversions and things he did. Um, That's the thing, isn't it? You get a lot of shredders who. In the rhythm section, it's just usually, you know, just jing, 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 or digga, 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 digga. Yeah, there's there's yeah. nothing interesting that they're really fleshing it out with. Yes, that's right. Um, I guess uh, there's a time and a place for the chugging and all that stuff, mm. but I guess as a one guitar band, um, Eddie had to do something a bit different. So yeah. yeah. You've got to be filling out that sound, haven't you? Yeah. Okay, well, on the rock stuff, we are going to go for a bit of uh, rainbow. No. Dio. Ooh. I keep this because it's got the word rainbow yeah. in it. I keep getting confused. <laughs> right. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. This could go a bit interesting. Hey, you've all heard me sing and fuck up. You all know. <laughs> Anthony. There's Mr. Anthony Merch. Hello, Anthony. Uh, right. Yeah, so we are going to rainbow in the dark it. I'm going to find more words for that. See, the thing is, I'd forgotten we were doing hit up to this song, so what I'd done is drunk <laughs> considerable amount of Pepsi Max oh, beforehand, which has really not yeah. done me any favours. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ed has also chosen songs, because um, Ed plays in a couple of bands. He plays in a band called Trailer Trash, which he plays bass on, and he plays in The Spin Lights as well, which is guitar. Yes, it is. Yeah. And none of them play stuff like this. They do not. It's... I've missed stuff like this, and this is kind of, uh, you know, my midlife crisis moment. Get to do it again. Yep. <laughs> I just get to do it all the time and never do it any better. <laughs> nah. Oh, you wait. <laughs> this could go horrendously wrong. Are you ready? Yeah. <clears throat>
These tracks have got some weird endings. No, ah, well done. Good work. <laughs> That's one you need a bit of better preparation. Yeah, I <laughs> for... kind of put that on you last minute. So no, that's all right. No, it's my bad. It's a bit... It was just uh, one of those songs. I How think. the fuck did he do that? Like, on tour, all songs like that, one after the other, for two hours. Yeah, that's crazy, isn't it? I think during the Heaven and Hell, kind of, when they reformed the later era, he did actually... They, they dropped tuned a bit for him. Well, he, um, I was having to listen to some of the t- tour stuff. Yeah. And they did quite early on, even when he was just, um, when he, was it Viv Campbell? It was Viv Campbell, yeah, great guitarist. Yeah, when he had Viv Campbell in the band and they were touring even in the early days, they did drop it down to E-flat. Yeah. So, Which I'm not surprised. No. That's a sensible no. thing to do. Definitely, yeah. To maintain that for on a tour. <laughs> but apparently he was, it was, um, he was, oh, Hello. Oh, cheers, Josh. Thank you, mate. Hi, Josh. Um, yeah, he was a bit of an enigma, because apparently he was a, a very good trumpet player. And really? because of playing the trumpet, that gave him very good diaphragm control. Ah, and his yeah. warm-up would be, uh, I think, red wine and a fag. <laughs> <laughs> and then just bowl on stage and Rock just and absolutely roll. knock yeah. it out the park. Yeah. Bastard. So, yeah. Um, what's your thoughts on Viv Campbell? Uh, I like him a lot. I liked Viv Campbell because... Um, he wasn't one of these kind of you know, meticulously perfect guitarists. You know, you could tell he was just kind of playing by feel for the most part. Mm. Um, you know, he's, he's mainly stuck to like, you know, minor pentatonic and Ionian minor, but it just worked really well. And yeah, amazing riffs. Um, I don't know much of his work in Def Leppard, I'll be honest. I, mm. But I was a big fan of him in Dio. I always find I like playing... When you hear guitarists that are so precise and clean, yeah, yeah. I find it just a little bit... It, it just loses some of that kind of rawness. You want a bit of noise. You want a bit of... Definitely, yeah. You need a bit of grit to it. A um, bit of scratchiness to it. Just It yeah. makes it feel like it's got something. Whereas, even though it, it technically... I think it's incredible, some of these people who can just play absolutely seamlessly and flawlessly. Yeah. You want it to sound like an electric guitar. Well... Rather than, a key- anyway. yeah. Rather than a keyboard. Exactly, yeah. Well, that's that's my excuse for not being meticulously clean when I play anyway. That's my excuse <laughs> for singing as well. You know, who wants to sing the actual yeah. note? I want to go around yeah. the note, maybe slightly if, below If I play it. a wrong note, it's not a mistake. I'm just adding a nuance to it. It's just Nice, mm, I like that. <laughs> By the way, very quickly before we carry on, um, if you haven't already, please, if you're on Twitter, follow... And if you're on YouTube, please like, subscribe, and tick the little bell as well because that notifies you of when I'm doing streams so you don't miss anything if you want to watch again, that is. Or if you're on Facebook, please follow. So I've got a little animation and everything. that awesome. did that yesterday. I'm very proud of myself. <laughs> I, I say I've got it. I stole it. Yeah. All the pieces. Oh, well, everything's <laughs> stolen on the internet, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. That's the whole point of Just it. Just use it by my own means. Yeah. Right. So... We've gone for the kind of the 80s rock ed. Yeah, yeah. So I suppose after that we had sort of grunge ed. Yeah. Um, At the time, like I say, that was kind of the big musical movement um, that was, you know, popular with the kids at the time. Um, and Just like heroin. Yeah, well, (laughs) I don't know what school you went to. It was just just, um, crystal meth in mine, so... Hey, uh. you don't look like this (laughs) through clean living, trust me. Um, yeah, so there were bands like Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, Soundgarden. Um, I wasn't a big Nirvana fan at the time, but I can appreciate them a lot more now. Mm. Um, but for me, it was Alice in Chains were kind of top of the pack because they combined that rock sound with the kind of slightly edgier 
alternative sound yeah. I felt quite well and yeah Jerry Cantrell amazing guitarist and obviously Lane Staley there's no one like him <laughs> no he was such a good I mean we've done this one loads of times on the stream but yeah it's one of those ones that is quite funny when you watch singers who've like covered this and everything when it comes to the big note you can all see them kind of getting ready to shit yeah. themselves <laughs> a little bit like this is going to be painful yeah <laughs> but Lane was just like the the video clips I've seen is just absolutely flawless with it. it was fantastic and Jerry Cantrell as well I mean uh, I think a lot of the vocals that people put down as Lane's vocals mm. actually you know, Jerry Cantrell's I think well they had that beautiful clash of voices yeah. where they the, the, the harmonics of the voices were so similar at times yeah. you couldn't quite tell who was That's singing right, yeah. what and the closeness of their harmonies yeah. just gave it this really eerie dirty yeah. kind of creepy sound it's like fantastic they were big Beatles fans I think that's where a lot of the, the harmonising ah, came from. That makes so sense. Yeah, it took the kind of harmony of the Beatles and put it on a really heavy rock band. The Seattle effect. Yeah, pretty much yeah. most grunge bands came out of Seattle, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, it's, it's kind of like Norwegian black metal if it's if it's not from there. It's just not true. So <laughs> I think it's the same with Seattle. You're not true unless you're from Seattle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, right, okay. So we are going to go for... <coughs> this might go a bit funny. Okay. Are you ready, Mr. Ed? I am. Let's do this. Man in a box, everyone. You've seen it before, but this time with a, someone who actually plays the game. Right 
Testament to Layton's <laughs> vocals, even when in the grips of heroin, he could still sing that better than me. Oh, it's, yeah, it's oh. impossible, isn't it? Uh, is the problem, no sleep, shouldn't have drunk the shit I did yeah, today. Yeah, yeah, again, I apologise. No, it's no, no, it, no. I, I normally do this one. Oh, I've, just I've heard you sing it before, so. Because <laughs> I've sung it yeah. better than that before. Yeah. Yeah, don't eat chocolate before a stream as well, I'm a <laughs> fucking dick. Oh. I'm going to prep better next time. I do apologise, yeah, Ed. It's, it's all good. It's good fun. It's uh, <coughs> yeah, right. Um, so, let's talk about a couple of elements of your playing, Mr. Ed. Yes. I see you're a big legato fan. Um, I am. I mean, I I like to mix both, really. I'll, uh, I'll do a bit of legato and a bit of alternate picking, and I've never really been rooted in one or the other. I just think, you know, whatever, whatever's needed. So are you a are you a spontaneous player or do you have kind of your presets where you kind of like to go generally how um, you work? It depends really. I do I do have licks that just crop up all the time that because they're kind of ingrained on me in mm. me, but it's usually one lick and then a Thank you, Hazel. Oh, thank you. And then a variation of of that lick. So, you know, I might I'll play the same lick, but I'll do it slightly differently every time. <laughs> so who do you think, out of all the licks, because we all, we all, as musicians, we all pretty much steal. That's yeah. all we do. Who would you say your biggest theft is? Like, for the amount of licks that you have in your library, who is your greatest person to Ooh, thieve from? That's a difficult question. I suppose, um, yeah, Randy Rhodes. I've stolen quite a lot from over the years. Um, Stevie Ray Vaughan, even though he's a blues guitarist, I kind of nick still licks off him and kind mm. of put them in a more of a more of a rock context i suppose um yeah i've just i've never really been stuck in one style i suppose i listen to to all sorts and so i kind of feed bits from everything really yeah cause you're a country fan as well aren't you yeah country blues i've kind of dabbled in jazz um i wouldn't call myself a, a jazz player but you know give it a go <laughs> yeah, you dabble. You dip your finger in like, oh, that hurts. Ooh, I'm not going yeah. there again. <laughs> no, that looks technical. I'm not doing that. But yeah, I don't know. I suppose a bit of everything, really. Marty Friedman was a big influence. Um, I'm but I think, yeah, my main kind of, I suppose, I don't know. I've never idolised one guitarist, but close to that would be Dimebag Darrell, really. Oh, thank you, Joe, for the uh, subscribe. Very kind of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yeah, I suppose Dimebag Darrell. I suppose a lot of his stuff I mean I good segue yeah yeah nicely <laughs> done sir well done I was trying to I don't think I've talked about anyone we've actually played yet so I thought I'd kind of get that in there <laughs> so what was um? when did you first hear Pantera again I just you know I've been getting into the more rocky stuff like the Guns N' Roses and Van Halen and then I had some friends at school who were m into the more heavier side of things mm. and I was kind of almost sort of a bit dismissive of it at first thinking oh this is going to be you know too much for me and then I heard Pantera and I was like wow just everything about the band the riffs the drums the, the vocals at the time as well because I think they were one of those bands uh, you know I don't know if you agree but maybe like Led Zeppelin where every member of that band had their own unique sound yeah yeah it was a, a power what's uh, how did you say a power quad power what? quartet quartet yeah it's quartet right? that's yeah. correct Power quad. <laughs> Power quad. That's something people a, ride around on here in bike. the country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, just the riffs and, yeah, Dimebag sound more than anything. It was just, you know, that overdriven solid state. It was just, it sounded like when you put a Pantera album on loud, that the speakers were just going to... There's uh, nothing quite up. like a Pantera sound, is there? There wasn't no. really any other band that had that kind of, like even Vinnie Paul's drums. They were very distinct That's drum right, sound. Yeah. Everything was unique about Pantera. Yeah. And they were brothers, obviously, <coughs> so grew up playing with each other. So they were kind of, if you listen to the riffs on a lot of their album, they're very much locked in with the kick and locked mm. in with the snare. Sort of similar with, obviously, Van Halen as yeah, well. Yeah, you've got yeah, definitely. 
Yeah. I said one of the reasons Alex, I think I heard Alex Van Halen had to alter his playing style to fit in with the stuff that um, Eddie was playing. Yeah. So that's why he, you'd get his kind of very odd timings and yeah, it was to complement what was going on. Yeah. <laughs> Atta's yeah. seen me before. Your sound is tired. Sleep well, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. He Thank is you very tired, much. yeah. I am. <laughs> Thank you. Cool. Right. The great thing about this Pantera one is that it's already got the vocal track on it. So uh, we managed, because we couldn't uh. get a proper backing track for this. So um, we managed to find a guitarless track that still has Phil's vo- I think it's the actual audio from this song. So are you ready for this, Ed? I think so. So I can sit back and bask yeah, in all your It's not fair that you're getting out of it, but you know. <laughs> I might, I might, my voice is knackered, so I could probably double up on it and it wouldn't <laughs> sound too bad. Okay, so we're going for, what was the first Pantera album you heard? Um, it was actually Far Beyond Driven. Ah. And that was one of the heavier ones. And mm. at the time I thought, oh, this is a bit much. But then listened to it a few times and yeah, that kind of got me into the heavier side of metal, I suppose. And from then on, this, the same friends were like lending me Carcass albums and Morbid Angel albums and I went down that route for a bit and uh hard work on album. Oh yeah. Bill Steer is just an amazing mm. player. Right. Okay. Who drummed for Carcass? Was it Daniel Oh no, he he had a um did he have a it was the guy who had a seizure. I've got a th- Ken someone around. Was it was a it? brain tumour or did he Yeah he Yeah, he may have I think he had a seizure or something related to the brain anyway. Um, yeah, because he's never been able to get back to sort of how he was, has he? It's, it's caused him a no, no, quite a disability. Very, very sad, but uh, I so think he was an amazing drummer as well. The he whole was, yeah. band was phenomenal. Yeah, and they were, you know, they had a sense of humour about them as well, which mm-hmm. I think is you know rare in some bands. But yeah, because that was um, was it who was it who went on to do Arch Enemy? Uh, Michael Amott. He played on the Heartwork album. That's it. Yeah. 90s had a significant effect on our generation. Yeah, I mean, I was into the, I was a Brit popper to yeah. start with, and yeah. then discovered the darker side yeah. later on. Well, um, you know, the Brit pop. I think I wasn't into it at the time, but it's a, a good foundation. There's, you know, solid songwriting there and mm. melodic songs. It was good. Did you find? Cause, I mean, if you were playing since 12, did you seem Daunted because I think one of the things is depending on what kind of music you're into, you've got certain genres sort of uh, lead people in gently, don't they? Like punk, for example. Yeah, punk was you didn't have to be able to have much technical skill to play punk, some Brit pop as well. But when you actually start hearing metal, yeah, and the heavier stuff, is it kind of like holy shit, okay, how do they do this? What mm. are they doing? Is it quite intimidating from your point of view? Um, it is now because there's so many people around that can play their ass off <laughs> there's embryos yeah, that are coming yeah. out now. You, <laughs> you just look on YouTube and there's some 12 year old playing Flight of the Bumblebee person, somebody born in Japan and the thing that gets yeah. born first is their guitar yeah that they've been playing for nine months because someone's managed to surgically implant <laughs> exactly. a guitar in I there I think the thing with me was when I started playing um, you know I was, I was prepared to learn all sorts I just liked the sound of the guitar but metal wasn't particularly popular at the time it was really alternative um, which you know we kind of Verges on metal, a lot of mm. it, like Alice in Chains and Soundgarden, but it was that, and then Britpop, and then whatever horrible dance music was in the charts at the time. What is love? Exactly. Baby, don't yeah. hurt me. Oh, that, that's that's not horrible. That's a, that's a great. Song. That's a classic. Too. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so for me, I was a bit of an outsider playing all this kind of, or trying to play all of this more kind of intricate rock stuff, like mm. the Van Halen and Pantera, and you know, whereas every other band was doing, you know, whatever Nirvana song they could they could muster. Um, so, yeah, at the time, you know, metal wasn't really a big thing. So it was more kind of a shock value, like, what are they doing? Yeah. Okay, here we go. So uh, we're going to do what Ed's going to do. <laughs> no pressure. Mouth for the War by Pantera.
Go on, Phil. That last riff, the da 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 What happens if you play a really nice major chord on those bits? Should we try it? Should we try it? Go on then. Let's have a listen. Do you want a clean tone or? Uh, as, as is. Let's have a listen. So if you get... Oh, no, that's minor again. So if you get a like... Just a minute. That's it. So you get... That sounds even more sinister. That's almost black metal. Yeah, that's <laughs> nice. <laughs> Pull in and push in the rest of duration. <laughs> Try to do something this determination. Yeah. <laughs> something nice. like that. Yeah. The sound coming from his throat is like a throne of rebellion. Phil was a very angry man. He was, yeah. And still is, I think. He is, yeah. He's just a bit of a fatter, angry man. <laughs> he is, but yeah, his his voice back then was just, I don't know. There was nobody that could, I mean, as a singer, I don't know what you think of him technically, but yeah, to, I mean, he to had me, how um, he could change from the two styles was just Yeah, incredible. I mean, o- over the years, obviously from self-abuse and various yeah. things, his, his voice just got lower and lower and oh, lower. absolutely, yeah. yeah. Now when you... When you hear him talk, it just sounds... It's just all guttural. He's kind of like Sylvester Stallone in The Expendables. It's just... 
But um, yeah, the thing is, the more you fuck your voice up like that, yeah. the easier it is to do those kind of vocals. So that's why you yeah. heard him. He like in the went in the Cowboys from Hell days. You know, he used to be able to do all the real yeah. high yeah. falsetto, yeah, yeah, and all that kind of stuff. And then obviously, as the years went on, his voice just got lower and lower, and yeah. the singing kind of um. His dic- his diction went for actually talking to just kind of <laughs> too much whiskey and too much weed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You end up with no consonants. It's just all vowels. <laughs> but um, oh, hello, James. Oh, Charvel. Mm-hmm. Yes, mm-hmm. that's very nice. How many guitars do you have? Too many. <laughs> There's no such thing. What are you talking about? Um, yeah, I, I can't talk about them all here because I'm hiding them from various family <laughs> members who want me to get rid of them. So, <laughs> um, so if uh, anyone out there has got some storage space, the thing is, I don't know uh, guitarists think, but if you play in cover bands and play different styles of music, you need a few different guitars. Well, that's my excuse anyway. Do you just like buying guitars? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was, uh, yeah, Jan says, I can help you with that. <laughs> Leave your number. We'll talk later. <laughs> we'll exchange guitars. I uh, know. I think there is. It, I think it's, it's the equivalent of saying, uh, my argument is, if you have a partner who thinks you need to get rid of your guitars and say, how many pairs of shoes do you own? Very you good own, point. You've only got one pair of feet. And I do make that point quite often. Yes. But to be fair, my partner doesn't really. It's more my daughter that has a go at me when she comes around to see me. It's like, You've got another guitar. No. How old is she? Uh, six. <laughs> 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 Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, she's uh, she's going to grow up in the words of uh, Little Shop of Horrors. Big and strong. Yeah, yeah. But she, I'm teaching her, actually. Oh, yeah. excellent. She's starting to learn. She's coming on quite well. Yeah. yeah. So what have you got for a uh, first guitar? Um, it's a guitar lele, so it's like a ukulele-sized guitar, but it's strung in A tuning because of... You know the size of it and that, but mm. uh, yeah, she's learned a few little chords and you know just playing like nursery rhymes and things. The melodies, oh, excellent. Are, and yeah, I think if she sticks at it, she'll be good. Yeah. It's when she comes in one day and go, "Daddy, listen to this, and play some Megadeth," and you're like, "Oh yeah, just plays eruption through to the end," and then I'm like, oh. "Well, she's six, so I reckon a year's time. That's generally the way it is on kind of Instagram and yeah. YouTube. So by yeah. the age of seven, she'll be shredding." Well, the problem is, I, I don't. You want you think, wow, this is great. I want my kid to be good at this, but you know, you push them, and then it becomes your thing, and they go off it and rebel, and then yeah, probably you know. Do you think there is? Um, I know from a lot of a uh, piano, actually from teaching many people, it's the parents who I wish I could have learned when I was young. Little Jimmy, I shall live vicariously through you. Yes. Get in that room yeah. and learn stuff that I can't be asked to. Yeah, exactly. Or the dad who's like shouting at his son while he's playing tennis and or whatever sport he pushes him into. And, you know, I try to avoid that. But you do get a bit like that once, you know, do you? You, once you see that they're good at something. It's like, well, if I just push you a bit further, but yeah. that's not good. You end up being like a pageant mum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what does a guitar mean for you, Ed? One word. Can you explain? In one word, Ooh, Ed. That's a, that's a really difficult question. Sexual. Sexual. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose people have likened it to that sort of thing, but... Um, I always have. Yeah, I don't know. That's the reason I'm singing so badly. I'm just constantly orgasming sitting here next to you. <laughs> I could see. You yeah. see my stains on your trousers. It's all it's all coming out of my <laughs> sock onto the floor. Um, I don't think I could explain it in one word, but I don't want to use the word companionship, but you'll never... I think someone once told me you'll never be bored if you have a guitar. That's or a good word. I like that. Very yeah. nice. Well done. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. It just gives you that... Or any musical instrument for that matter. Having know. a creative... Um, what's the word? A creative tool at your ex- ex- exposure? Yeah. That's, that's, th- that's not the right word. You know, I no. need sleep, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're talking about exposure and uh, sexualising the guitar. It's, yeah. Uh, it's all going downhill very quickly. What, yeah, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Having a guitar at your... Disposal. Disposal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, of it's, bodies. It, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like exposure. <laughs> but yeah, because then you've just got a creative outlet basically wherever you go. Yeah, I mean, whether you you know write your own stuff or whether you just enjoy sitting at home playing you know other people's songs, it doesn't matter. It's just something that you can occupy yourself with. And yeah, it's... I don't know about your musical 
you know, your musical instruments, but it's got me through some, you know, hard times. That, you know, it's something else I can concentrate on. Yeah, especially with um, because you're a songwriter as well, aren't you? You've dabbled well yeah. in, in the band we've done together, Guardians of Andromeda. We will finish our second album at some point, <laughs> but um, we may be in a nursing home by then. But pretty much, yeah. <laughs> um, but no, I know from writing stuff like that, there's sort of elements of what you're going through in your life is filtered into that for a sort of uh, a creative muse and all uh, those kind of things. Definitely, I mean, it's not necessarily all on display, but I think oh, it's going to be in there somewhere. Mm. You know. Yeah, it's it's all the subtext in terms of the mood and all the many layers. <laughs> <laughs> right? Did we have another one? I think so. I think we did, didn't we? Um, what was it? Uh, was there an Ozzy Osbourne one? Bark at the Moon. Yeah. Was that in there? Yeah, or anything you want to do, really. Should we do Bark at the Moon? Yeah, give it a go. I should be able to sing that. I think. Famous last words. I'm not sure I can play it. But <coughs> yeah, I think that was on the list. It was on the list, yeah. but... Yeah. What are your inspirational people? Ooh. Um, I'd like to thank my mum and dad. Yeah, mum and dad, and dog. Um, Dogs are always inspirational. <laughs> it's not my dog, actually, but... Yeah. Doesn't matter. Any dog is inspirational. Yeah, well, just whoever's around you at the time and whoever's, you know, bringing... Positivity, I suppose, or whoever is, you know, inspiring you. Is there a famous musician who nearly made you quit just because you just looked at them and thought, you're, tar- you're so terrible that you just put <laughs> me off music? <laughs> a famous musician? Um, yeah, the thing is, it's, it's not an Olympic sport, is it? So, you know, you can be, you can be crap, but, you know, you might write good songs or, you know. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, I think... There's been times where it's like I've got burnt out with music. I don't like most people do at some point. Yeah, I I found that. You've been through that at one point. Actually, we've got some musicians watching and everything. Have you got ever got to a point where you just felt that music just didn't? I mean, I've I've changed over the years. I know music doesn't have. I love the performance element. Mm. I love playing with other musicians and interacting with crowds and things. But the actual music side of it, yeah, doesn't pull. It was like years ago I would spend hours and hours just playing my instrument and playing music yeah. as well yeah boom um, <laughs> <laughs> but then sort of these days I have to have a, almost a reason and a cause that I'm aiming for to practice I don't have that same passion of practice no anymore yeah I know what you mean I think you know, for me it's just you know I'm not a teenager I don't have five hours every night to just sit and woodshed scales so if I'm going to play music it has to be something either you know meaningful either creative or learning another s- a song for mm. a band I'm doing the same as yourself um, must be difficult for you because you just play everything under the sun so I've noticed how bad things go when you play a lot of instruments that you don't put a lot of time into <laughs> <laughs> so a- as the years kick on like um Singing, apart from tonight, is my main one. So obviously yeah. singing a lot of band, I get a lot of practice. Yeah. Um, but like my my drumming's not too bad. My guitar playing has gone absolutely down the shitter. Re- to the, to the point where I doubt that. No, I, <laughs> tri- I think a lot of it is you know you it's still there somewhere. You might lose some of the you know the muscle memory a little bit, but it'll you know. Do you find sometimes it, if because the, the thing I found as a guitarist, I've lost the connectivity between the brains and the hands. I don't quite have that fluidity where you get that transmission of, I have an idea, here it is in my hand, it's coming out on the fretboard. I've yeah. kind of lost that. Yeah, definitely. Um, have, you ever, have you ever experienced that kind of thing or where you yes. just find that there's, there's that breakdown of communication between you and the instrument? There has been, and... Um I think it's either through, you know, whether it's the brain not communicating the signal fast enough or whether it's physical, you know, because, you know, we all get aches and pains, you know, I get a little bit bit of arthritis in my hands, so I can't quite do the things that I used to be able to do. So I've had to change my playing style, I think, to accommodate that. Mm. Um, You know, whereas, you know, I might be able to sweet pick all over the place, I might have to do something a bit different. Yeah. This is called getting older. 
ladies Please. and gents. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Again, I don't know how these artists too, like put your people like Steve. I mean, I think Vi had to have quite a s- severe operation, didn't he? On he his did, yeah. Tendons and things. He did, yeah. So it's a. I suppose if you're in a, that league, you're probably getting constant medical help. You're absolutely doing yeah. all the right things that you need to for your body. The other thing is, Steve Vai's, I can't imagine he's going and working on a building site for eight hours or whatever, you know, with, as kind of, well, at my level anyway, I've still got a day job and, Mm. you know, that takes it out of you. Whereas, you know, if you're a professional musician, I guess you've got more recovery time. True. And you don't, yeah, so you don't have to do manual labour and wreck all all your body. Um, James Jansen, what is the riff that makes you glow when you play it? That is a splendid question. Oh, can I play it? You it's can. It's uh, an Ozzy Osbourne riff. It's um, flying high again. It's that. It's a really simple riff, but yeah, you know, I just love the big kind of open chord. It's just fun. Yeah, yeah. It's just got that nice little cheekiness to it. Yeah. Is that is, is that a Randy Rhodes one? It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so many of his riffs were really dark sounding, but fun at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, Crazy again. Train, prime example. You get this real like dark, da 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 da. Then you get la 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 la. Which I didn't realise is exactly the same chords as uh, Hammer to Fall by Queen. It is, yeah. And also yeah. that um, Jack and Diane, little did it, but Jack oh, yeah, and Diane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, that's another, another great, great riff there. Just a beautiful bunch of little chords. I'm not a, as big a Queen fan as yourself, obviously, but that song. Oh, I hate uh, them. They're a bag of shit. <laughs> <laughs> is that after playing them for so long? You've kind of <laughs> no, still, still haven't got bored. No, yeah. it's still, a, still a strain when you come to do the gig. And you're like, is this gonna work? Yeah, because then you realise why Freddie changed all his vocal lines so that he uh, could do it live. Yeah. It's like, yeah, because it's really fucking hard. Um, internet and rich art based music, a lack of B twelve. I'm sure there's a lack of a lot of things <laughs> in this. <business. laughs> I saw a pianist. He runs twenty k for his music performance. See, now that's dedication. It is, yeah. yeah. I could ride twenty k on my motorbike. That's probably as far as to get to a gig. <laughs> that's it's a good call. point, though. That um. Is it Atta? Yes. Atta's making there that you don't really hear much about the actual physical side of guitar or any instrument of what, you know, wood conditioning help, you know, having better circulation or yeah. better breathing. I think better breathing is definitely a lot of it because obviously, you know, if you're tense, you don't breathe as well. And you well if you look at a lot of the session musicians, and I know uh, D. Snyder from Twisted System was talking yeah. about this, he said that they all, you don't want old fat guys going out on stage sort of it just looks bad and he said also you need to keep in shape to be able to handle the rigours of touring yeah so that's why a lot of these session guys like um, who was the one who was playing with Whitesnake for a while oh Aaron what was what was his name he's one of your favourite guys oh the Dutch has he got a Dutch sounding name you got uh, Vandenberg and then but then the guy who was playing with them sort of probably he went on to play with Dio Doug, Doug Aldrich Doug Aldrich yeah yeah, so you look at someone of his physique. Now you can see that he looks after himself. Yeah. Pretty much all of the White Snake band were none of them were fat, and <laughs> oh, they all know what it means to be a touring session musician. Yeah, and you've got to keep healthy to be able to do it. This is why I'm not on tour with White Snake. <laughs> <laughs> and otherwise, you turn into Vince Neil. <laughs> yeah, which nobody wants to do. Mick, Mick Jagger, prime example. The man's got yeah. to be what nearly eighty. Yeah. And he's got more energy than me and you combined, and probably most of us sitting at home. Yeah, yeah. Doug wrote some of the albums. What a play. Oh, phenomenal. Yeah, he is phenomenal. Yeah. So, Aaron, I presume we'll be doing some White Snake when you uh, venture over here into our little room. It'll be good. So, yeah. Aaron will be one of my guests, and I will make sure, Aaron, that I get some sleep and I drink some water beforehand. Because uh, if we're doing yeah. White Snake, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so we're going to go for Bark at the Moon, Ozzy Osbourne. Uh, okay, so we need bass back in. That's out. Okay, are you ready, Ed? Let's do it. Sorry, I missed it. Sounds almost disco. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes, one, two, three, four. Ba ba. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Stick around way too much. <laughs> oh, well that blew out the cobwebs, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Got lost somewhere there, but yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Jakey Lee, such a such a great player. Yeah. I know you don't really hear much from him anymore, do you? No, he's in a band at the moment called Red Dragon Cartel. Oh, okay. And he did a band after Ozzy called Badlands, who are like a bluesy rock band. Right? Has he still got the chops? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Definitely. Yeah. Excellent. Right, Atta says bravo. Bravo, Mr. Ed, bravo. Oh, thank you very much. Too kind. Right. 
Well, we are drawing towards the end of our programme, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us. Sorry I sung really badly on a couple of your songs, Ed. No, it was it was great. I, I, um, I nearly pissed myself during the Aussie impressions during Bark at the Moon. So, Have you... Are you a Steel Panther fan? <laughs> um, not a band I've ever really listened to, to be honest. If I can recommend anything, watch Steel Panther doing Crazy Train Cover. Yeah. Michael, is it Michael Starr? The singer yeah. from Steel Panther. He comes out and does the best Aussie impersonation yeah. I've ever seen. He actually comes out with all the wet hair in the black oh, clothes. Okay. Yeah. And it's like method singing. The guy, he just takes him off. So that you're yeah. actually looking and you're like, hang on, is this, is it him? <laughs> is it not? It is brilliant. He, he'll do things like keep putting the microphone in the stand, taking it out again, putting it in, taking it out, walk off, then realise he hasn't got the microphone <laughs> in his stand. <laughs> I guess that's their thing, isn't it? Kind of, you know, taking off, uh, taking off other bands, but yeah. doing it very well. Absolutely yeah. brilliant. Well, watched. and Satchel, what a player! Yeah, he used to be in a band with Rob Halford called Fight in the nineties. Oh, 90s. really? Yeah. Oh Obviously, wow, I didn't back, know that. That was before he had all the kind of, you know, glam rock image. Yeah. But yeah, they were kind of like a bit Pantera, I suppose, in a way. But Ooh, I might have to uh, venture down that road. Yeah, they're, wor- they're worth a listen. Um, some, some interesting stuff there. Cool. So. um... It is like a small piece of yummy candy. Ah, bless Aww. you. Thank you. Uh, so, where can people find you? I know you sent me some links that I will put it, be putting in the video later on. Yeah, um, you can find me playing locally in a, a metal band called Trailer Trash. We do two thousands mainly rock covers, so it's like you know, Limp Bizkit, Linkin Park, System of a Down, that kind <laughs> of thing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wh- what do you think of Fred Durst's new hairstyle? Um, it's a strange combination of, uh, I don't know, something from the Beastie Boys sabotage video is what it reminds me of. and it's. Do you think he's <laughs> doing it ironically or is he serious? That's the question. I can't work it out yet. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm not being funny. I mean, I'm losing my hair, but he even in the late 90s, he didn't have much hair. So no. that's got to be a wig, surely. Do you know what? I really hope it's not. <laughs> I hope that is his real hair because if yeah. it is, it's it's epic beyond belief. It's interesting, but then you know, Wes Borland has been dressing like an Urukai orc <laughs> from Lord of the Rings for the past <laughs> ten years, so it's not that shocking, really. Not really. No. Then the rest of the band are just like, nah, just it's kind of away. like a transsexual yeah. Urukai <laughs> who's just a uh, pre-op. Yeah, I think the rest of the band are just uh, we're just going to fling a tracksuit on like we did in the two thousands. Yeah, I've got the outfit at home in the <laughs> in the wardrobe. That's all I need. <laughs> Alrighty, so Trailer Trash. Yeah, um, I'm also in a band called The Spin Lights, and we kind of take, you know, cheesy pop songs and rock them up a bit, um, like Lady Gaga and Aha. Aha! Aha! Um, yeah, and just a bit of everything. We also do, you know, weddings and functions and things, so we'll, we tone our set down a little bit for that, obviously, as you have to. But Is Gaynor still singing for you? She is, yeah. Awesome. If yeah. you get a chance to see the spin lights, they are awesome. Gaynor is a fantastic singer. She is, yeah. She's amazing. Um, I got a drummer called Nigel, who's also you know a powerhouse, very good drummer. Um, Harv on bass. Um, yeah, and just just like everyone in Trailer Trash, really, uh, great musicians and entertaining. Excellent. Um, and you also are doing a originals band. I am. Um, it's in the kind of recording stage at the moment. It's a project. Um, I started doing at the beginning of the lockdown, really. Um, I found myself, you know, off work for a week, as a lot of people did, and just thought, right, I need some sort of outlet, and, yeah, just started recording. Um, it's going to be called Red Sky. It's very Black Sabbath-y, I would describe oh, awesome. it as. Yeah, very riff-based. We've mm. um, got Miguel, um, who some of you might know. I think you I might know, know Miguel. him. Um, he also sings of Mayday Miracle. The uh, singing Hobbit. Yeah, yeah, he's a yeah, he's a great guy. Um, he's doing vocals for it. Um, yeah, at the moment we're in the process of recording. Our drummer left halfway through, so we've had to yeah, drummers find do that. another drummer. But yeah, at the moment, just hoping to get the recording done and get an EP out. Awesome. Let us know when it comes into the airwaves, and we shall have a listen. I certainly will. Jolly good. Right. Thank you very much, dear boy. Thank you. Lovely Thank you for having me. No, good to see you. Cheers, everyone, for tuning in. Lovely to have you all with us. Thank you. And. Um, so, I will uh, keep you all informed when we have another guest. I'm hoping possibly to have another guest next week. So, we shall see who that will be. I haven't decided yet. I need to sleep, and then I shall make <laughs> some plans. So, take care, everyone. All the best. Much love. 
Thank you, Ed. Good night. Thank you.